Welcome to Dr. B Music Theory. Welcome, welcome. One moment as I check, make sure that the stream is coming and is accurate. I had a few technical difficulties last time and I want to avoid those this time. So, oh yeah, that's looking good. All right. So it looks like we're up and running, folks. It's so good to have you back. Uh, as always, this is a live Q&A, and I have a few questions from uh, before that I'm going to start off with. And then as things progress, if you type your questions in the chat, I'm going to look at those and I'm going to answer your questions. So this is a great opportunity for anything that you've been struggling with or thinking about or wanted a, another opinion on, this is your chance. So I'm going to move over here. I have my, my laptop over here to the side, so if I look over here... It's not because I'm ignoring you, it's because I'm referencing my materials. So I actually wanted to start with a question uh, that was from a while ago. Uh, and it was from uh, Alex Gordon who asked, in a minor key, is there any information about how a minor five chord and a major four chord usually function? So again, the question is, in a minor key, using the minor five chord and using the major four chord. So this, this touches into what I've talked about in my lesson on mode mixture. And that's a good place to, to review after you watch this video if you want a little bit more, if you want a little bit more of the backstory and the building blocks of how that works, go ahead and look at my lesson on mode mixture. But let me give you a couple of examples on how it could be used. In general, if we're talking about the four chord, it's, it can often be used as a passing chord. And let me just give you a progression. Let's take C minor. And let me have the progression be, um, let me see, we're going to start with a one chord, right? Uh, one chord, a four chord, and then let's go, f uh, let's go to a five chord. Then let's go to four, major four, six, then five, six, and then we'll just repeat that progression and then it'll go back to one. So let's take a look at what this is going to be like. So again, we start on our one chord, we start on our four chord, we have our five chord. These are our foundational chords, one, four, five, in any key, major or minor. But here we have four, six, and normally, we would expect four, as it is right here, to be minor. But in this situation, we have an opportunity to use four as a major. Now, this is not the only way to use a major four chord in a minor key, but it is one of the most common and one of the most effective. Why is that? Well, if you know and remember the rules about your melodic minor scale and the ascending melodic minor scale, so you take uh, ascending melodic minor and your ideas about that and what you know about that, so ascending, and I'm going to write this down here. So if you want to take a screenshot or you want to just pause it to look at this uh, once it's been archived, you can, you can do so. The other is the concept of uh, augmented second melodic leap. And it's something that is usually avoided. So I put a circle around it and I'm going to put a, a slash through it. So these two things will help explain why this major 4-6 in a minor key is so effective. Let's also listen to it, because that's, of course, the real test. So if we're going along, we're in C minor. I just, I just played that for you a couple times uh, in a kind of like a, a pop piano style just to give you a, full, a little flavor. Now, style has a lot to do with the rhythm, the instruments. I could have made this sound like classical music. Um, 
if I had played different kind of rhythmic configurations, but it lends itself, especially when I'm repeating it, so that you have an opportunity to really, to really let it sink in. Because your ears are gonna, gonna help tell you when things make sense, and they're gonna try to, they're gonna make some connections for you. So, let's go to this. Why, why did I write ascending melodic minor? No augmented second melodic lead. Well, essentially what's happening here is we're treating this five major four, six, five, six. It's all essentially a five chord, right? It's all, all basically five. And it's just the four, six chord is really like a passing chord. It's really a passing chord. And it's taking us from root position five chord to first inversion five chord. And it's doing so by going up the scale as we would for ascending melodic minor. And the, the reason the ascending melodic minor scale works so well is that the half steps are closer to the destination, which is the C. So if we're talking about G, A natural, B natural, C, we want the half steps, the smaller intervals, to be as close to the target note as possible. So this half step resolution is really powerful, which is why going B flat to C, it's, it's just not as strong in terms of leading us forward. And so by the same token, we want to have everything leaning us up. So instead, the, right, your option would have been having an A flat here and or a B flat. But you can see that those A flat, B flat, that's, that's lower in pitch. It's closer to the G than it is to the C. And uh, then if you look at its counterpart, the A natural and B natural, right? So A flat is closer to the A flat is closer to G, A natural is closer to C. B flat is, is uh, it's not closer to G, it, it's closer to G, not in terms of the actual interval, but compared to a B natural, it's closer. So as we move up, that, that decreasing ratio of intervals helps guide us. Why is that? This is not some random artificial thing. It's connected with the overtone series. As you go up the overtone series, and this is talking about science, acoustics, the, the, the way sound works, the intervals get smaller and smaller the higher you go up the overtone series. So when we start going up in pitch, it makes sense that things are going to start getting smaller, it's going to lead us up. And it's why when we do the descending melodic minor, they would be B flat, A flat, because then the half steps are closer to the G and guiding us towards that note. So the reason we have an A natural here, instead of the A flat that we had in the minor four chord, is to help us with that upward melodic, ascending melodic minor scale. And you can hear it, and I'll play it one more time for you so you can hear it, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice chord progression. We have the one, four, five, and we hear five has already got that raised leading tone, right? It's not minor five. Listen to minor five. It doesn't, when you have a minor five, it doesn't mean, it doesn't necessarily say you're going to go directly back to one. You could go to, you could go to like three or something very different. So when that B natural happens is it really wants to pull you up to the C. So when I do that, and here I kind of delay the B, I go in the melody, I'm going B, A, G. So I'm taking it down and so the and I'm getting G A B in the bass. So it's like they it's a um, uh, voice swapping. It goes G in the bass, B in the soprano, A in the bass, A in the soprano, B in the bass, G in the soprano. So we get and then I might put an F passing tone to get myself to the third, or I could just stay there. Either one. So that's a great way to use four, a major four. Let's look at the other question that uh, Alex had was how to use a minor five. So let's take a look at that. 
I'm going to erase this stuff, make a little room for you all. So a minor five, and I, I wrote out some examples for myself so that I could, I could make sure I give you some options. C minor, start with a one chord. Let's go to five, six, and then four, six, and then major five. So again, I'm kind of showing you in this progression two versions of the same chord. In the previous one, it was minor four and major four and how they could be used differently. In this example, we've got minor five and then major five. So listen to this one. Listen to this one. Uh, let me see, let me, I'm going to go. Right here, and this one works really well as comparison, this one has that descending bass line that we talked about. Is what, This is the ascending melodic minor. This one goes C, B flat, A flat, G. So it's, it's, it's descending melodic minor, ascending melodic minor. And you can hear how that minor 5, again, kind of functioning like a passing chord. It just kind of like the, that, that downward scale just works so well that then when you get to here and you make it into a major five, it propels you back to the one chord in a, in a very, very compelling way. So there's yet, there's an example of the minor five. Let me give you another example for that, for that major four. Because these are, I'm just giving you examples of how and I think the principle in both of these cases are that the baseline is very, very important. That the baseline has a scalar motion and there's a certain integrity there. And what happens is the chord that's a little bit unusual, the major four or the minor five, and when I say unusual, I'm talking for Western classical art music. And some pop music uses them in different ways. Some of them use them in this, in this classical way, too. So it's good to kind of be aware of all the different ways in which these chords can be used. But what if we were to start with a minor, a minor one chord, and then go to 5, 4, 2 of 4. But instead of going to the minor 4, go to the major 4, then turn it into a minor 4. Uh, actually, it would be 4, 6 turn it into a minor 4-6, and then go to 5. We have a similar bass line, same bass line actually, as this right here. This is our 1 chord, that's our 5-4-2. Actually, we got one more note. Actually, I, I, I misspoke. We go C, and of course this, this is a treble clef, B flat, A natural, turns to an A flat, to a G. And that would be our bass line for this latest progression. Let's hear what it would sound like. Bass line. You get the... And then the... E flat goes up to an E natural, and you kind of has a sense of wonder. It stays in this this major thing, and then it then it turns dark by going from F major to F minor, and then G. So here, uh, the four six again, you have this kind of this this bass line being a very critical component on how that chord works. That's not to say that you can't simply be going along in a minor key. Root position minor one chord to root position major four. And 
And then let's go to a let's go to a major five. Major four, minor one, major four, major five, minor one, major three, major four, major five. So there we're using all root position chords, but using that major four. It gives it a very different feel. It feels different. Uh, in a certain sense, it feels more contemporary. And that's because composers throughout history were always being starting with like, well, what's, what's the basics? And then how, how you can do something a little unusual, something different, something varied. So I hope that, uh, Alex, I hope that answers your question uh, about how a couple ways in how you can use a minor five chord in the minor key, which would be also kind of a modal version of, of the minor, where you're not raising the leading tone, as well as how you could use kind of from the parallel major, that four chord. Just so you know that I don't forget these questions, and I have so many, part of me is like, I need to, I need to quit my day job so that I can... Uh, I can, I can really answer all your questions or hire someone. I'm not quite sure what to do yet. But some of these questions are three years old. Three years old. So at this point, I hope whoever asked the questions has already like figured out the answer. But in case you haven't or in case there's someone new here who hasn't figured out the answer to these questions, I'm going to go over a couple of them before I start turning to the comments. So this was based on lesson two. So all the videos I have on YouTube, uh, there's a, people do a great job asking questions in the comments. I can answer some of them, but I don't get to all of them. So this question was, and I'm going to read it for you. So E flat to A sharp. I'm going to write it out because I want to make sure everyone's following along here. So E flat to A sharp is not something we analyze as an interval when we see it written in notation. But if I was asked to pick out that interval, I, I would hear a perfect fifth. So in the case to notate it, should I be writing E flat to B flat instead? And so this is a great question on how you hear something versus how it's written. And let's revisit why this is not the way you would write something. So in music theory, we designate intervals of a fourth, which is this is a fourth, E, F, G, A. Doesn't matter what kind of E, doesn't matter what kind of A. E, F, G, A is always a fourth of some kind. We analyze them as either perfect, if they're a half step lower than a perfect interval, it's going to be diminished. If a half step higher, it's going to be augmented. We don't go beyond that. We don't go beyond like double augmented or double diminished. You could make up those words. Uh, and you could, you, it would make sense, and, and I'm sure there's some music theoreticians that do that, and that's fine. But in traditional music theory, so going back, there's not a need for double augmented or double diminished. In part because in most circumstances, that's not the way you would hear it, which is what this question is really getting at. So looking at it, E flat... F, G, A flat would be a perfect fourth. So A natural would make it an augmented fourth. A sharp, it's theoretically, in terms of traditional theory, we just don't call that anything. We just say, that's not an interval we name. So you, in the, in the textbooks you, or on an exam, you might just put an X, not theoretically possible. Unless you wanted to come up with something like double augmented. When you hear this interval, certainly in isolation, you are not going to say, ah, oh, sounds like a double augmented fourth. Nobody in the world hears it that way, especially in isolation, right? You hear it as a perfect fifth. It's consonant in sounding. Now, sometimes when you put things in the context of other notes and chords around it, these things can change uh, in terms of how you hear something. Uh, 
but there's no context that I can think of that's going to make you hear this interval as a double augmented fourth, which would be a dissonant sound. So let me, let me give you an example of that because I, I don't want to just talk hypotheticals. Let's take a look at, let's say, um, if I play, if I were to play A flat to C flat. You can go ahead and type in the chat what interval you think this is before I say it. Don't type it after I say it. Uh, but A flat to C flat. Type it now. Time's up. All right. It's a minor third. And this is not a, this is a consonant interval. If I go for you, it sounds, sounds constant. It's an imperfect consonant. It's not as consonant as a perfect fifth or a perfect fourth, but it is consonant. Now, let me do this. Let me instead go A flat, B natural. interval sounds dissonant. It's the same sound, but I changed the context underneath it. I turned it not into a minor third. Go ahead and type it in the chat. Now, when I review things, I'll, I'll give a shout out to those who got it. It's an augmented second. And, you know, young, young, and by young I mean not in terms of age, but in terms of knowledge of music theory. Young music theorists will say, Dr. B, it's the same thing. I'm like, no, it's not. It's enharmonically the same, but the context, context matters. In this case, I was tr tr harmonizing this with a minor four chord and this with a major five chord. In this, I just did it as a, a minor chord, like a minor one chord, an A flat minor. And here I went F minor to G major. And so F minor to G major, As you would find in a, a C harmonic minor scale, that's a dissonant interval because of the context, because of what else surrounds it. So if I play an F minor triad and then a G major triad and I play A flat to, to B, no matter what you call it, like you could call it C flat, it's just not the way your ear hears it. So this is an important thing to remember when you're talking about music theory. Music theory should reflect the way you hear things. And the fact that you can call it something else in music theory doesn't mean that's the right way to do it. The theory has to reflect the way you hear it. So you're going to hear A flat to C flat played over an A flat minor triad as a consonant interval, and you're going to hear A flat to B natural played over an F minor to G major triad as a dissonant interval. Again, dissonant Consonant, this is not the same as thing as say good, bad. It's tension, relaxation. And music is all about the right mixture of tension and relaxation to make us feel stuff. Too much relaxation, we get bored. Too much tension, we get a nervous wreck, and then we get bored. It's the interplay between the two. So again, we're not talking good or bad, we're talking about the different types of ways these sounds interact with us and how their interaction, if, if done correctly and appropriately, can make us feel something. So that question about the, the E flat to the A sharp, I can't think of any context where you're gonna hear that as dissonant and it's just written wrong, right? It's, it's just not the way you'd write it because it's not the way your ears are gonna hear it. So that's my answer for this question from three years ago. My apologies. All right, but it gives you a sense for those of you who are thinking about in these, in these terms and how it can apply to other. Let's jump forward. I got one, again, this is all from three years ago. Uh, uh, Miski Wilkshake writes on lesson 10. He, write this, and this is interesting because it kind of relates to a little bit of things. It says, interesting. 
Dr. B doesn't teach minor key Roman numerals in relationship to the parallel, parallel major. You'd get a lot of theorists who'd argue that the diatonic triads in minor key should be notated as, right, so this person is absolutely correct. Not all music theoreticians agree on exactly how to notate stuff. And so there's definitely people who would disagree with the way I do things. And in, in, in this situation, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I think, I think that there's, a, there's multiple ways that make sense. So they would call, and, and this is what, what's being said, they would label it 1, minor 1, 2 diminished, flat 3, minor 4, uh, let me just make sure I have everything right. Uh, right, yeah, yeah, 5, flat 6, and then either flat 7 or 7 diminished, depending on what form of, of 7 chord we have, whether it's the raised leading tone or not. And this is different. This is different. So here's the differences. And I'm not the only one that does it this way, right? So there's a, there's a music theoreticians, ha there's not a, a common uh, agreed upon format with this. Which kind of relates to like the last YouTube video where someone was writing how the use of the word motive that Americans often use versus motif, which most Europeans use. Like there's disagreement, right? And in other areas of music theory as well. In, in a certain sense, it's like the standardization of terminology. Who gets to determine, like, first off, does everyone, does all the music theoreticians, do they all want to have a standardized terminology? And if they do, do they think that should be their version that everyone should change to, or that they should change to somebody else's, right? So these things are interesting, kind of like culturally, how they unfold over the years. Who determines what the words mean and the right terminology and the standard? So the, the version I use is simply to do this, instead of calling it flat three, call it three. Instead of flat six, call it six. And instead of seven, just, uh, uh, let me do this better, just calling it seven. And the point is that the actual, so in, in the case of the, the one chord, the reason there's not anything different here is that C is the root in both C major and C minor. And for a D minor versus D diminished, the root is still the D. Here the root is different, right? In major, it's E, and in minor, it's E flat. So uh, some theoreticians will indicate that the root is different here by lowering it a half step, calling it a flat three. Now, I do this when it comes to Neapolitan chords. You call it a flat two. So we're basically saying from the, from, you know, normally you would expect in the key of C a D, but it's going to be a D flat. So we do do that. And I do do that. Um, but not in this case. And so here, F, G, these are the same. This is why there's nothing indicated. But here you're talking about A flat for minor, A natural for major. And here you're talking about B natural versus B flat. And so whenever theoreticians use the flat six and the flat three, they're basically really making it really clear how it's related to the corresponding parallel major. And to be honest with you, I haven't given a ton of thought as to which one I think is better. I, I was taught the one that I use, and that's in the textbook that I use, and I've seen it in lots of textbooks. That doesn't mean it's the best way. Uh, and I can certainly see the argument of saying, well, look, you know, the flat three, you're indicating its relationship to the parallel major. Um, on the other side of the argument, why, why is that important? Why is it important to, sh sh you know, you're in a minor key. Why are you talking about major? It's not what's happening right now. We're in the minor key. And three is minor, and we know that. So it's kind of like a, 
Uh, like we just assume we're in the minor key that the three is different because that's the way it is, as opposed to relating something to a key, the parallel major, that we're not in. So without giving it some further thought, the pros and cons, uh, I don't know which one is better. And if you want to voice your opinion in the chat, that one might be interesting for us to pick up this discussion. So if this is something we want to like think about and hash out a little bit together, Go ahead, add your, add your opinion in the chat about that one. But it's a, it's a very, you know, like, I think that to their credit, uh, the, the first thing they wrote in the comment was interesting. And I agree, it is interesting that there's these two different methods on how to indicate Roman numerals in a minor key. All right, I want to move forward to uh, um, uh, lesson 21. Lesson 21. I got a question for, uh, in Lesson 21 that says, Hey, Professor, uh, I have a question. At the beginning, you said that in an E minor situation, so let's write, let's erase this stuff and put in E minor so we can follow along with, all follow along with the question. In an E minor situation, E minor key, E minor, all right. You would expect a D sharp. in a D natural rules out E minor. So this was, this was lesson 21, which was about melody harmonization. And it was, uh, I'm pretty sure the question's referring to, how do you know whether, when you're gonna harmonize a melody, whether you should harmonize it in the relative major or the relative minor, okay? So the question, again, is referring to melody harmonization and whether it should be in a major key or a minor key. Because you're going to have a key signature, but that doesn't tell you whether it's in a major or minor key. Part of the challenge is going to be look at the melody and, and listen to it or analyze it and ask yourself, is this melody implying a major key or a minor key? So what I said uh, in, in the question here, you would expect a D sharp and that a D natural rules out E minor. Why is that? To my understanding, both G major and E minor have a D natural. Uh, it's a fifth of G major and the seventh of E minor seven. So if you could clarify that for me, that would be great. So this has to do with the way in which minor is varied. So in a minor key, you will have a major six, and a minor six. You'll have a major seven and a minor seven. You get both. In that ascending melodic minor, you get your majors, and in the descending, you get the minor. All the other scale degrees stay the same. So scale degree one, two, three, four, five, those are, are solid. But what makes minor particularly varied and interesting and not quite as relaxed and settled as major is because you got both the major and the minor of versions of scale degree six and seven. Which ones are the most common? Well, the major seven is the most common and the minor six. So when we talk about the harmonic minor, that's what we're getting. This is for our harmonies. Most of our harmonies are coming from this. They tend to have the minor six scale degree above the root and a major seven above the root. So when I say I see a, uh, a D natural, that's going to be very uncommon to see in the minor key. Yes, it does happen. Yes, it can happen. But in the question, they said, well, what about the E minor seven? Well. E minor 7 is not a one chord you normally see in, in classical style music. A, a minor 1 chord, a minor 1-7, one, one this is very common when you start getting into modal music or the, the like neo-modal music. So we're talking like Debussy going into jazz. You might see this as a 1 chord, a 1-7 or a 1 minor 7. 
But you don't see that until like the late 19th century, early, early 20th century. Before that, this would be maybe a, if you see a minor seven chord, it's, it's probably a two seven. It's probably a two chord. It's not functioning like a one chord. One chords would be minor triads. So that kind of explains why when I, when I say, oh, you see a, uh, so again, what did I say? Uh, when I say, oh, I see a D natural, that kind of rules out E minor. It's because one minor seven is not something you see until late kind of French Impressionism jazz. And it's so much more common in G major, which is the relative major, you're going to see a ton of D naturals. In E minor, you're not going to see as many. So when you're trying to decide what, what, whether this melody you're going to try to harmonize is in a major or minor key, you probably should go with what's the most common. Again, we're talking about artists and musicians and composers. They're going to find a way to do the unexpected. But mo when you're learning things for the first time, you want to make sure you thoroughly understand the expected before you even start to try to think about the unexpected and how to break the rules. There's a funny meme where it says like music theory one, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then music theory two, except then, except here, or if you do this, right? And that's, it's not, it's not hypocrisy. It's not bad teaching. What it's reflecting is that it's important to understand what's expected, how these rules work, and then how you can break the rules or establish new and different rules and how you can make exceptions that give you variety and interest. It's that balance between the two. Human beings, our psychology, it's like this, this is why it would be great to get in a room, in a, room a music theorist, music theorist uh, a psychologist, um, a motivational speaker, and like have them all talk about like how music does things and how people's brains and emotions work. We as human beings, we want cert, uh, a, 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 a certain amount of certainty. We like to know that, yeah, we're not going to starve tonight. We know our next meal is coming. There's a roof over our head. We want a certain amount of certainty, but not too much, right? If there's too much certainty, we know everything that's going to happen for the entire day. We get bored. We want some variety. So it's this... It's our psychologies crave a certain amount of certainty and an, a, a, some amount of variety, which we could call maybe uncertainty. So with that, I mean, I do have some more backlog. I have a lot more backlogs from three years ago, but I've, I've, the last couple times I've run out of time in the chat, and I don't want that to happen this time. So I'm going to turn my attention to the chat, and we do have some people there, which is wonderful to see you all here. Um, yeah, yeah, negative harmony. I still haven't done it. I still haven't done it. I look at, I've, I've looked at a few things, um, and actually Danny Pippen, who, who's the, the moderator for the Facebook Dr. B fan page, which by the way is, is doing really well. Uh, we got people there who are asking questions, and there's other people on there who are helping them. Like I was saying, I, I wish I had more time to answer everybody's question. I just don't, so I'm just really thrilled with what Danny's doing in terms of, uh, creating uh, a community and a culture where you can ask any question at any level like don't you know you don't you shouldn't feel stupid for asking like what's the difference between a b flat and a b natural right we all start at a certain level we all then develop from there and so he's been doing a great job with that and i see that jazz hub is now on my case too so it's at the it's 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 important. I'm going to get to it. I apologize that I haven't done so yet. So I know all capitals and question marks. I appreciate the urgency. Keep lighting that fire, right? Like if you keep telling me, eventually I'm going to, I'm going to give you what you want. So I, my apologies. Alan, I, I skip you first. Uh, how do I efficiently teach the rules of harmony without getting tied up with artistry? Ooh, that's a great question. Let me, let me, let me read that one again. How do I efficiently teach the rules of harmony without getting tied up with artistry? Wow. How do you teach the rules of harmony? So part of it is finding 
the right excerpt, the right example, or maybe writing it, where, where artistry is kind of eliminated, stripped from the equation at the early stages. So, and this is like, this might be controversial, so, so bear with me as I, I think through it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself on the spot by doing things live and not knowing what questions I'm going to be asked or whether I have all the answers or whether I've thought it through completely. So there's a couple schools of thinking. If we go back to Bach and some of those composers, the way they taught themselves composition very often, at least what we hear about in terms of in the legend, is that Bach would get the scores for Vivaldi concertos and he'd do an arrangement for a keyboard instrument. And so he learned composition and learned harmony by looking at the masters before him. And Vivaldi wasn't that far before him historically, but he was. So he, he examined Vivaldi's music and he learned from that example. Now, there's no way to separate the artistry from the harmony when you learn in that fashion. And in a certain extent, that's a good thing, right? Because the harmony is in service of the artistry. We don't like having a bunch of harmony that follows all the rules that conveys no emotion does no one any good. So, you know, you can, you can argue, well, why would you ever want to divorce the harmony from the artistry? Well, let me play the other side of the coin because the artistry has so many exceptions already there. Unless you're learning and copying a piece that's really pretty basic, the artistry is taking into consideration all sorts of things beyond the harmony. It's taking into consideration harmony, uh, the timbre of the instruments or voices, the setting for which it's going to be performed. May, if there's lyrics, the text and how they influence and relate to the music, uh, melodic, rhythmic uh, ideas and, and things. To, there's just so many things. And if you're just learning something new, you can't take in everything all at once. It would be like telling a, a little baby who doesn't know how to work, how to walk, you're gonna teach them how to do hurdles. Like, it's too much. Like, the whole idea of a hurdle, like if you don't know how to walk yet, you can forget about trying to learn the hurdles, you know, the 50 meter hurdles or whatever. So there's an argument to saying, listen, we gotta, we gotta make it simpler so that someone who's starting off at the beginning can really learn these things. So that would be the argument to, to kind of separate the harmony from the artistry, uh, if, if I'm interpreting that question in the way it was intended. And so to w the way to do that is to do little excerpts where you take an actual piece of music, but it's only where it's like following the rules you want it to follow. So you can teach that concept and not have to get into all the other things. It's like, it's like parents, right? You don't necessarily want to talk to your kid about the birds and the bees right from the get-go. You want to be like, I'm going to save that conversation until a little bit later where, where they know a little bit more and they can put it into a bigger picture. We don't want to have any misunderstandings, right? So there's that, it's a, like, it's a similar school of thought maybe, maybe an analogy. So if you're doing that, you can maybe teach the harmony without getting into the artistry by finding excerpts that kind of just fit that, those rules. And this is a challenge. In theory, in theory textbooks, the theory textbook that I often use in my college classes, there's a few things where you're looking at and analyzing something and we're like, we haven't covered that yet. You know, it's, it's a, a little bit of a flaw in the textbook because the students sometimes get thrown as they're saying, wait a minute, didn't, weren't we just saying that we can't do that? And the answer is, well, yeah, we were, but we haven't talked to you about how, how you can make an exception. So I hope that, Alan, I hope that answers your question. It's, it's a great question and, and certainly one of further, further contemplation and, and consideration. Um, you know, it, it, I think it, it's going to boil down to who you're teaching, at what stage, at what age, uh, in terms of what methodology, to how you're, you know, what's the best way and what's the best time to be combining the harmony rules and all that with the artistry. Because in the end, it's all important. So it's a, really a matter of sequencing and how you introduce it. Uh, in general, uh, I, I, think, I think I often subscribe to a parallel approach where we talk about harmony and isolation and pare it down. And then I say, well, let's analyze this thing. And if there's something you don't understand, yeah, just, just log it and then kind of skip it and be like, oh, I might have to come back to that and say, why does that work? So you start kind of having these parallel tracks of 
harmony and isolation, and then a complete artistic work by doing score analysis. Uh, Kenny writes, finally, I can catch you live. Hello from Belgium. Oh, I've never been to Belgium. It's on my list. I'd love to visit. Hey, Kenny, glad you can make it. Uh, Mr. Nothing writes, without a teacher, a person can train himself by books and notes, online videos, question mark. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, there's always someone throughout human history that's the first person to figure something out. Usually there's a lot of experimentation. It takes a long time. You could be that person. You could just be like, I'm not going to look at, I'm not even going to read a book or look at anything online. I'm just going to invent everything from scratch myself. Now, you're probably going to reinvent the wheel and you're probably going to think you've discovered something new only to realize that someone else discovered it some decades ago or hundreds of years ago. But absolutely, you can do that. So there's that side of it. But then, yes, you can teach yourself by just doing things online and, and from books. Super valuable. This is why libraries are wonderful things. And when, when you have all these, uh, you know, Andrew Carnegie giving all this money to create libraries that people could just go in and read books, it was like, it was mind shattering, just free information. It was mind boggling for the late 19th century that that was something that was now becoming available to people. So absolutely you can teach yourself. I recommend that the trick is, is of course, you know, there's, there's pitfalls, right? And you want to be aware of those pitfalls. Some of those pitfalls are finding the book that's at the right level for you. If the book is too complicated, you might get frustrated, you're going to give up. You know, that, that, that would be a shame, right? But if you get the book that's the right level for you, that puts things in the right sequence. And, you know, let's be honest, there's some teachers who are better than others, and there's some books that are better than others. Not every book is written clearly step by step. Not every teacher teaches clearly step by step. So part of it is finding the right books. And so kind of doing a little research into like best music theory book, best, you know, best online video series, whatever. I hope you guys say Dr. B music theory is on the top. I hope you say it. Uh, but I really try to do that step by step. But yeah, don't don't get you know if 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 you can, if you don't have access to teacher, whether it's because of your other obligations or financial, whatever, you can still do it. Don't let that stop you. You know this is one of the reasons why I put these videos up here and why I'm still doing this is because I want I want to live in a world where everybody knows more about music than they do now. And that I want to be the person who gets to listen to the music that gets created by a culture that can appreciate that level of music and create it. So I love so many different styles of music. Sometimes there's certain styles of music where I'm like, oh, I long for a little bit more harmonic complexity. I'm getting a little bit bored. And I think to myself, wouldn't it be awesome if everyone who's writing pop music knew music theory one, two, three, and four? And wouldn't it be awesome if everyone in the world who's listening to music and loving music had enough musical knowledge that they could appreciate and not be overwhelmed or feel, uh, feel that it's like elitist or snooty or anything like that to hear music that had a higher level of complexity. For me, it's, it's having that complexity. I'm, and again, there's, there's a place for simplicity and there's a place for complexity. There's room in the world for both. Because sometimes I feel emotions that are just plain, simple emotions like, I'm happy. I'm eating this cookie and it tastes great and it's making me happy. And there's other times where I'm feeling emotions that are really complicated and it's, it's mixtures of, of frustration with excitement, with anxiety, with boldness. And I have this one emotion that's this combination of all these. It's a very complex emotion. And I want music that can help me feel and express all my emotions, my simple emotions, all the way through my most complex emotions. So, so without a teacher, yeah, you can train yourself. Don't, don't, don't give up on learning stuff. You can do it. Uh, for my theory class, uh, and I've, I've done this more than once, and I'm happy to do it again, I, I, love, I love these HarperCollins college outlines, you know, music theory. It's, it's no fancy pictures, inexpensive, bare bones, gives you the facts, boom, 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 right? So I love that book. Um, 
I love, and it looks very different. This is an older edition. Uh, someone else has taken over, but it's harmonic materials and tonal music, a program course, where what they have here is they have the questions on one side and the answers on the other. So you got to cover up one side while you look at the other. It's a great way to teach yourself. Right? And again, if, if you kind of like look this up online, you can get these things like on Amazon for just like, like a buck, two dollars or something. It's like, you know, we, we are so fortunate to live at a time and in a culture where this kind of knowledge is so available. You are at the right time to learn something, learn music theory without a teacher. There's so much great, so many great resources on YouTube. All you need is your computer and a Wi-Fi or go to a public library. There's really nothing that should stop you from learning something you want to learn. All right. Uh, Elton Wilde, what do you think about Schoenberg theory of harmony book? So I haven't read his, his uh, Harmony book. I know he wrote one, and I have, uh, I don't know if I have it handy. I have, so I have, I did read his book where he talks about his own theory method, like 12-tone, uh, specifically 12-tone, as well as, as um, uh, a little bit about atonality. Uh, but he didn't like to call it atonality. He liked to call it pantonality. So... So keep in mind if, you know, this is where being knowledgeable on your words and, and paying attention in English class pays off, right? So A, whether it's atypical, uh, atonal, A means not. It's a negation. So atonal is, means not tonal. And, and Schoenberg did not like that designation. Um, usually in English classes, they'll tell you that you should avoid defining self, something by what it's not. Instead, you should define something by what it is. So he liked the word pan, and pan means all. So Pan American, all the Americas, North and South America. Uh, now, pantonal and the problem with pantonal, and I think maybe the reason, even though Schoenberg wanted to use that word pantonal, it did not catch on. Most people don't say it. They say atonal. Or, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the way, the reason it doesn't is because it's, this is kind of a, uh, an oxymoron, meaning it's two things that mean the opposite. Uh, tonal, by definition, means that there's one central pitch, chord, and scale. That's what tonal means. Pan meaning all central pitches. It's like, no, no. Tonal means one. So when you say all one, it doesn't add a, it's like a paradoxical. So I think that's why, whereas not tonal, is actually very descriptive. Uh, because when you listen to, especially early, early Schoenberg, and through his 12-tone stuff, there is no one central pitch scale and triad. There isn't. Um, and he, he did that by design. He did not want there to be one central. And so it's not tonal. So I actually think atonal is, is the more accurate terminology for what Schoenberg was doing. And pantonal uh, is, is uh, you know, and I'm not quite sure. I don't really remember why he wanted to call it pantonal, what his justification was. Maybe just because he didn't want to define himself by what he was not, like I was saying earlier about with the English language. But uh, I think it's more accurate, to be honest, on, from my side. Now, his, his, I, I, if I remember correctly, he did write um, a music theory, like a, a harmony text that dealt with more traditional harmonies as well. And, and I don't think I've read that. And I, I know that my experience was when I first started teaching music history, uh, I would play some Schoenberg and nobody in the class would like it. They would all be like, what is this? I don't like it. And so I was looking for all the Schoenberg music that, that I think that, that I thought people would, would enjoy more. And so that to kind of help them get into it. Um, and so I'd try to find different pieces by Schoenberg. And at a certain point, uh, I was unsuccessful. At a certain point, I realized that I was misrepresenting Schoenberg by doing that. By trying to find Schoenberg that was the most palatable, the most like tonal music, 
the thing that the majority of people would actually listen to and say, oh, I like that, or that's interesting, that I was actually misrepresenting Schoenberg's output. Uh, his output to this day is not generally liked by audiences. Um, you know, if the Metropolitan Opera, which doesn't usually do a Schoenberg opera, but they might do an Elbon Berg opera, you know, the audience size is much, much smaller than it is for Donizetti or Rossini or any of those composers. So it, it's never really, um, it's never really, people have never really come around. And so sometimes people make the analogy if they say, well, look at Beethoven's music. Beethoven, when he was composing on his third period, there was a lot of people who didn't like his music, but then, you know, they came around and they liked it and people appreciated that Beethoven's third period was, was really genius. Um, and so that's what's happened to Schoenberg. And I don't think that's actually an analogous situation at all. In the case of Beethoven, they came around within the decade, a decade or two. In the case of Schoenberg, it's been a hundred years and they still haven't come around. So I don't think that analogy quite holds up. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'll keep my eyes out for the, for, and see if I can come up with a little bit more information. I know that there's some of Schoenberg's early works when he was more of a student are very much in a kind of Wagnerian, Richard Strauss, late romantic. There's definitely dissonance. There's definitely pushing and pulling, but there's still uh, some tonality that kind of holds it all together. Uh, and some of that music is amazing. When I first heard that music, I was like, that's Schoenberg? Because I was only used to kind of like middle, like, you know, from Pierre Lunaire, 1911, 1913, uh, like that 1913 on Schoenberg was what I was all I really knew. So to hear something that was before that, that was very much in a different style, I, I was, was very surprised. All right. Life of Brian asks, what aspect of music theory justifies chromatically descending dominant sevenths? Ah, I can answer this question. Chromatically descending dominant sevenths. All right, so if we go C7, B7, B flat 7, A7, let's say A flat 7, let's go all the way to G7. Let's call it, it's quits there. So chromatically descending dominant sevenths. So there's a couple things that make it justify. Smooth voice leading, right? If everything's going down by chromatic, it's going to be smooth, right? And the human ear can hear a pattern, and that pattern is half steps. So smooth voice leading is one act contact. Uh, pattern recognition, that's a, very, that's a very simple pattern. Simple in terms of understanding what it is. Complex harmonically, but in terms of understanding the pattern, down a half step, down a half step, down a half step, down a half step, that's very simple. So smooth voice leading, easy to recognize pattern, and get ready for this next one. This next one's going to be great. These are something you could call a tritone substitution. So that's the last. And let me play it for you before I, I move on, right? Let's go. Right? It sounds good, right? And let me just, I did it with the, with the fifth on the top. Let me do it with the, do a little higher and with the third. So that's what we're talking about. It sounds great, but check this out. I'm going to put F7 here. I'm going to put E flat 7 here. I'm going to put D flat 7 here. So, Circle of fifths, I'm going to write that down because tritone substitution of the circle of fifths. So C, F7, that's down a fifth, B flat 7, down a fifth, to E flat 7, down a fifth, A flat 7, down a fifth, D flat 7, down a fifth. And we know the circle of fifths is foundational for all music. It's the acoustics, that, that fifth. So when I say tritone substitution, 
what am I referring to? Well, I'm saying that BF, that's a tritone apart. A tritone is either a diminished fifth or augmented fourth, depending on whether you're going up or down. So F to B would be an augmented fourth, and B to F, the inversion, would be a diminished fifth. Both of them are called a tritone. One, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, tritone. One, two, three, four, five, six, tritone. So C, F sharp, C, it's it's the exact same number of half steps. You Here's the octave, C to C, exact same number of half steps, F sharp is smack in the middle. So tritone, one, two, three. That's where it's coming from. It's dividing the octave into three kind of like pieces. C, F sharp, C. This diminished fifth, augmented fourth, these are just inversions, uh, inversions of the same interval, uh, and they have that same quality. So why does a tritone substitution work? Well, the roots are very different and, and dissonantly different. These are not like co uh, consonant substitution, but what is the third of an F7? I'm going to let you think about it for a second. The third of an F7 is an A. What is the seventh of an F7? It's an E flat. What is the third of a B7? It's a D sharp. What's the seventh of a B7? It's an A. So what happens is we see that the the third, and so third seven is seven third based on the tritone. So F7 and B7 have the exact same pitches for the third and seventh, just swapped and with an enharmonic spelling. So if I go like this, which is also a tritone, interestingly enough, and I go, that's an F7. And if I go, that's a B7. The fact that they have two notes in common and the roots are a tritone away, there's enough similarity. Those two notes in common make it so that the ear hears them as being related. And why am I not talking about the fifth? Well, because the fifth is the most commonly omitted note. And so we're kind of just leaving it out because root three, seven are the defining chord members for a seventh chord. Fifth, especially if it's a perfect fifth. If it's not a perfect fifth, then, you, then it's important. But if it's a perfect fifth, it's kind of implied and you don't really need it. So if, especially when we're talking about tritones, we can leave that out and we're, we're good to go. And so this descending chromatic, how do we justify it? Well, these are just tritone subs. Every other chord is a tritone sub from the circle of fifths, which is a super cool kind of thing. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a great progression to like... It's, 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 it kind of has this, this slippery slidey, but it's going somewhere. It's going, it's like, it's almost like if you're on a water slide and it's kind of got some curves in it. It's a, it's a, it's a very cool feeling. All right. Good question. Um, four in a minor key creates a Dorian sound. No. Mm, okay. I'm going to write it out here. Cause again, we want to make sure everyone's looking at the same thing and thinking So let's say we have C minor, C, uh, D, E flat, F, uh, G, normally A flat, right? And then, uh, why did I write it like that? A flat and then B flat. But we know sometimes A naturals, sometimes B naturals because it's minor. Right, so yeah, it does give it this Dorian feel, right? So if we have the A natural, we're going up to the C. It definitely does give it a Dorian feel. 
uh, especially if you keep the B flat in there. So if we have. Uh, let me see, what could I go to after that? Let me go to a, a, a D minor. So I'm going to go C minor, F major, uh, G minor, D minor. back to C seems a little awkward to me, but, but you can play around with it. Uh, I, might, might, I might prefer if I was writing like some kind of pop, pop modal song, go into a B flat major triad after it. So I keep going minor sonority major. Minor, major. Let me get my head out of the way so you can see that. So. And that's very much, so by, by placing C minor at the beginning and having uh, so having it in the, as the first chord, and then having a sequence of, of four chords, which is symmetrical, and then repeating it, you're going to hear C minor as, as one, but it's going to be very much in a Dorian mode uh, harmonic scheme, because I'm not raising, I'm, I'm making sure I have some B flats in there, in this G minor and this B flat major triad, but I am also have that A natural. So that that's kind of like how you can take so you can take a modal scale and just use the chords that would be diatonic within it. And you can come up with some really great stuff. And so um, some of my, some other questions that people have suggested and asked, requested that I go over is like to analyze some of the Beatles songs. Because the Beatles were writing pop songs with modal harmonies. So it wasn't just one, four, five, one. I mean, some of the early stuff was. But then some of the other stuff was getting into Dorian and maybe a Phrygian mode. And there's so much uh, musical theater that loves, uh, like Disney, that, like a lot of the Disney musicals love Lydian mode with that augmented fourth. And so there's all sorts of ways that you can take traditional music theory and tweak one or two little elements and come up with some very interesting and kind of fresh sounds. Kind of goes back where it's like, you know, people might say, well, I just want to learn that. And I'm like, you know, that's great, you can, but it's also kind of good to have that whole foundation of the traditional expectations, and then, then you kind of learn the modal aspects and the modal variations. So yeah, you're absolutely right. The four in a minor key creates a Dorian sound, but it doesn't have, it, 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 like, that alone won't do it. To, to make it Dorian, you're going to need that B flat in there. Because if I just, because if I, if I start raising the B natural, it's going to sound like mode mixture. It's not going to sound like Dorian unless I got that B flat in there as well. Good question. Good question. A lot of great questions today. If possible, here's this is from Kenny. Kenny, Kenny is writing, uh, if possible, I'd love some tips on melody. You know, this is another aspect that a lot of people have been asking me. And I, and I absolutely admit I have not spent anywhere near as much time talking about how to compose and analyze melodies as I have harmonies. And that's kind of a, uh, a problem, I would admit, with all music theory texts and all music theory learning. Because melody, if we think about it historically, we go all the way back, ancient Greece, Romans, early Catholic church, all that music is one melody. There's no chords, there's no backup singers, there's no multiple melodies, and there's no counterpoint. It's all one melody. And composers at that time were solely thinking, how do I write a one melody that conveys an emotion, that creates a feeling? With one melody, how do you do it? And that's all they worked on. Historically, that's where we started. We, we didn't start by being 
human beings and being like, here's some good chord changes. I don't know what melody is going to go with that, but here's a bunch of good chord changes. It's melody that's the, 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 the primary. Uh, and when we think about our favorite song, we're often singing the melody. We're not arpeggiating the chords that go behind it. Um, maybe there's some very special, special people out there uh, who, who do that. But that's not for most of us, right? So, yeah, melody. So, Kenny, I, I went on a tangent there. Let me finish reading your question. Uh, whenever I try to work on melodies, they often end up too classically styled. While I try to go for a more romantic, modern, or even fantasy theme. Ah, oh, such a great question. Um, so, aspects of melody. And, and again, analyzing the melodies from different styles. Because each style has different, you know, and they're not going to be big differences, but there's differences on the kind of melodies, rhythms, melodic leaps, scale versus arpeggio. Like, there's differences with every style on, on how melody works. Ornamentation, all that stuff uh, gets, gets factored in. So, classical melody, so we're talking like, we're talking like Mozart, is going to be different than uh, romantic. Let's think... Wagner, uh, and then you said fantasy, which which is a basically romantic goes to Hollywood, and there we get this kind of like fantasy. Um, I'm going to give you another quick story just because it's interesting. I was in Paris a number of years ago uh, doing some performances and giving some lectures, and I was in a music store. And the owner who, who had sponsored me to come and talk came in as I was looking through some, through some of the, their, their backlog and stuff and said, hey, hey, did you know Branford Marcellus is here? Branford Marcellus is a super awesome jazz saxophonist who also played uh, with Sting and lent a whole awesome jazz element to Sting. He was on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Uh, so fantastic saxophonist. And he was there, and, and, and I was like, whoa, that's great. And so I, I ended up, you know, so I got introduced to Branford Marcellus, and we were talking, uh, talking about some things. It was great. Um, and we ended up exchanging a couple emails, and we were talking about different compositions and compositions today. And he was saying how there's so many contemporary composers writing in this kind of Western European extended classical tradition who have these very interesting ideas, it's very sophisticated, it's very learned, they have so much knowledge, and there's no melody. There's no melody that anyone who's not super, super, super educated could have a hope of following. And he was saying, wow, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And all the people, he was saying this to me, all the people who know how to write a melody are in Hollywood making tons of money. That's where, the, that's where the composers who know how to write melodies are going and making money. And I was like, huh, yeah, I think that's, like, as a generalization, not true across the board, of course there's exceptions, but as a generalization, I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. And so when we're talking about this kind of Hollywood fantasy, we're, we're really talking about taking these romantic Wagnerian elements and, and starting to blend in some other things, kind of like what we talked about a second ago, certain modal aspects, taking away some of the, 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 the like condensing it. So Wagner, man, his music is long, like hours. You listen to a Wagner opera, it's hours, hours. So kind of taking that, and condensing it is what a lot of the Hollywood composers do for like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, some of those, some of the Marvel superhero movies, and they, they, they condense it. So what are the things that they're, they're using? Certainly harmony is important, but there's certain melodic things that are also important. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about leaps, because that's probably the most important aspect of it. And I'm going to admit right now, I'm, go I'm going to do a very slash hap dash answer to your question because it 
it really deserves some serious time. And it's something that's, again, like with negative harmony, this is another one of those things that's on my list of like, it would be really valuable to make a, a, like a whole mini series of how to write melody, melodies for different styles. Uh, someone Rush wrote me that they were really interested in learning how to write in different styles so they can write for a British pantomime group ensemble. So for like puppet theater, I guess, or, or not necessarily puppet, but, but, but for theater, but, but with different kind of music, musical styles. So how to capture different musical styles. So I've been thinking about that. So I'm going to give you a quick version. The, the amount and kinds of leaps in a melody. So there's good melodies have a ratio of stepwise motion to leaps. Classical music, that percentage is a lot higher in the steps. So Mozart will like, so... So lots of steps, and when they're not steps, they're pretty much arpeggios, right? So if you want to write a classical style melody, lots of steps, scales, and arpeggios. A lot. You're going to have some leaps. Yes, you will have some leaps that are uh, a fourth or a fifth or a sixth or, or an octave or even a seventh which is a dissonant interval, so you're not going to find a lot, but predominantly steps and arpeggios. And when you get into the Romantic era with Wagner, you start finding wider leaps being a larger percentage. Not only wider leaps, but dissonant leaps. So more leaps and more dissonant leaps, like a tritone, like a, a minor seventh, um, like, like, a, like a major seventh. These are, are, are unusual leaps, unusual for classical, but usual. And then you're going to use some of that in your kind of Hollywood fantasy. You're going to have those same. You're going to, you're going to use more leaps. Now, it can't be all leaps. Otherwise, it'll sound like a, a musical ping pong ball or something. But you can certainly have more leaps. One of, I almost was going to do this today. Um, so when I was a kid, young, 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 I had a cassette back old school, old school technology. Cassette, it was like of ABBA, which was a, a, a European group. Uh, pop, they've, 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 their success has continued. It's kind of like amazing. It spawned Mamma Mia, the musical, which turned into Mamma Mia, the movie. And for some reason it came up and I, I started listening to some of these songs that I hadn't really listened to since I was like maybe 10 or 12 or something like that. And... Uh, I was listening to their song, The Winner Takes It All. It's like one of the only sad ABBA songs. And even then, it's not all sad because it then comes in with this driving beat, which kind of gives it this whole other level of emotional meaning. But the chorus is all built around ascending uh, having a, an ascending uh, minor seventh leap. And it'll do it, it'll, it'll have it a leap here, and then it'll go in a leap here, and then it'll leap here. And it's almost like a sequence. And they use that. And I don't know what it was, whether it was a combination of nostalgia or, or the, the power of the song with the minor chords and the way they moved, or that wide leap of the melody. But I was like, I started getting choked up. I started getting like all emotional. And I was like, whoa, this song is like hitting me in a way that I just... I didn't expect it to happen. And so leaps, leaps, I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker for, for good leaps. And, and that's certainly something, if you want to start writing melodies that sound more romantic or kind of Hollywood fantasy, you're going to want to use more leaps. Listen to, listen to ABBA, A, B, 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 A, the winner takes it all. You might think it's corny, uh, but listen to that melody. That melodies, they wrote, they wrote melodies, melodies that people, I mean, that people still like make movies out of. Um, so that's kind of, kind of cool. So check that out and listen to how they, that they were using the leap of them ascending minor seventh and how it, what kind of emotion that creates in the song. And I think that will help you. That will help you. And I know that I could talk a lot more and I should about melodies, but that gives you at least a start on how to go for a more romantic, modern, kind of theme for your melodies. More leaps. 
Uh, all right. A harmonic analysis of Ravel Pavan for a dead princess. Ooh, yeah. That piece is like, that's another one that can get you choked up. Because there's just something like, whoa, about that piece of music. Um, I, I can add that to my, my list of things to look at. Because that's, that's, a, that's a great piece of music. Uh, Kenny writes again, I suspect an aspect of this is more chromatic harmony outlined by the melody since harmony and melody are very intertwined, correct? Yes, melody and harmony are very intertwined. Melodies will often imply harmonies. Uh, and certain harmonies only support certain melodies. So yes, there is definitely a, a relationship. Um, so any other tips? How does one keep track of all this without make making the melody get too weird? That's a good question. That's a good question. So here's something that, that, that I think might help you with that, Kenny. So there's uh, what I call the, the, changing, the changing tone versus the common tone. So what you can do is when you get a set of harmonies, you can look for what note, how, what notes change between these harmonies. Um, so let's say we just have uh, C minor to F minor. And you say, listen, I want to make sure that my melody really shows what's different about F minor as compared to C minor. I want to find the changing note. If that's the goal, your melody would go from G to A flat, and it would sound awesome. And you'd be like, oh, because there's no A flat in the C minor. And you get this half step motion. Changing notes by half step are super effective. They're like, they're close enough that the ear's like, ooh, shift, but, I, but it's connected. So find the changing note. Find the note that changes between the harmonies. Now. If the harmonies are so complex and they keep changing so much and you keep going for that changing tone, that melody could get kind of weird, kind of fast. And that's where you might want to find the common tone. So let's take that same thing, C minor to F minor. Here, you find the notes that are in common or stay the same between the chords. So C minor, you just take a stick on that C rather. And you can do that with any level of complexity. Now, in the case of the chromatic descending uh, major minor seventh chords, that's going to be a lot harder, right? Because has nothing in common with nothing in common with, right? So there are certain chords where there is nothing in common. So you got you got an option. You got to have two options there. One is to rely on patterns, right? Because even if if you're just going, let's say, let's say your melody, you want to do a melody that says. So there's a, there's a jazz song called uh, Well You Needn't. And it has a, a bridge that has like these kind of chromatic up and down major minor seventh chords. And. It has like ba do ba do and do ba do and do ba do and kind of like has this pattern that goes through the chromatic chord changes. It's a little bit weird. It's definitely a little bit weird. Um, but the pattern is so recognizable and obvious that the ear follows it and it doesn't sound so weird as to be unpleasant. Now, when you're improvising on Well You Needn't, sometimes you can try to make your melody and go through that same pattern as well. But sometimes what you'll do is you'll play over it. So you'll basically say, well, I'm going from let's say I'm going from C7 to G7. I'll just play as if it was all C7 for that whole time. And the chords will change underneath me, but I'm just playing C7. It's going to be very dissonant. There's going to be a, a, a rub. But when you play over, you have like the melody you're playing has the integrity of being, I'm a, C, I'm a C7 melody. I make sense. And the human ear will say, oh, listen, I'm latched onto this thing that makes sense. Now these harmonies are going on underneath it, and they don't go on, but 
at some point when you shift to that G7, everything then switches and makes sense again. And everyone goes, ah, oh, okay, I get it. So you can, you can, you can play over. This is like the difference often between blues and jazz. Blues will play the blues scale over a whole series of chords. And jazz will try to play all the changing notes. Both of them work. They have different emotional effects. They have, they have different styles. So when you're asking the question, uh, how do you keep track of all this without the melody too weird? Well, either use a pattern that kind of goes through the, the weird changes and, and, and say the pattern helps make it sense, or have a melody that kind of just floats over it. So you might say like, so they say you're going, let me see if I can do this. And again, at that tempo, I don't think it was super effective, but the idea of this, this thing that, ba, da, 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 that makes a ton of sense, just a triad or, or maybe a scale, you know, ba, da, dee, da, 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 and that just that and the things just shift underneath it. So it almost feels like this thing is floating, the, the ground underneath is shifting, but then it kind of comes together at another kind of more stable harmonic point. So that would be one way you can kind of achieve that goal that you were just discussing. All right. Uh, hey, Nolan. Hey, Nolan, how are you doing? For those of you, I'm giving a shout out to one of my current music theory students who's taking my class and we're working through uh, all right now we're just getting into triads and seventh chords and spelling them really well. So he's checking in. Andrew Nor Norris, hey Andrew from Croatia, a good friend of mine who who hosted me and, and when I visited um, when I visited oh from Croatia oh okay not in Latin uh, Slovenia anymore you must be at your your uh, your your other place how nice excellent yeah Andrew's a Andrew's a great uh, artist. Uh, visual painter uh, as well as documentarian uh, who's who's made some really interesting films and he's composed his own music to go with these documentary films so he's he's a great example of someone who's learning in all sorts of different areas and putting all different kind of art art together to to do some interesting work and he does has a house in this rural village in in Croatia where it's like like electric like all of us who are like you know worried about our smartphones and whether the cell ethernet cable is working like this is a place where it's they don't have those worries they have other worries but not those worries it's a it's a different so he's he's done some really interesting things and in looking at their music their cultural music from a different part of the world different influences uh so he's done some really great stuff so andrew good to good good to see you good to hear from you uh we got another from yan Please may I ask for your approach on counting polyrhythms. For example, 5-4, I always feel lost counting in the middle of it and only get back on beat by luck after getting to 20, of course. <laughs> uh, Yan, all right, let me talk to you a little bit about 5-4 and any kind of these, what's called these odd meters or asymmetrical meters. So 5-4, this is a, you know, for a, for, for, those jazz musicians, but also like uh, the group, uh, this was a couple, maybe 10, 15 years ago, Gorillaz, they did a, a one in 5-4, and then the Mission Impossible theme song, 5-4, so there's a lot, there's some popular songs, and it's really fun if you Google, um, you know, songs in 5-4, there's a whole list of things, but 5-4 is usually, these are, let me just first play. Ah, oh, sorry. So that would be an example of 5-4. Any odd meter is some combination of 3 and 2. Because where we, human beings, are generally, we're thinking either a 2 subdivision or a 3 subdivision. So if you think about simple meter and compound meter, that's, that's, that's it. We, we don't really talk about other meters that have other divisions of the beat. So 4-4, four, four, quadruple, simple meter, division of the beat is 2. That's why it's simple. 12-8, uh, 
compound quadruple meter division of three. So very often these fall into some combination either, and phi four will either be three plus two or two plus three. And it all depends on where it starts and the, and the accent. So if I go like this, that's three plus two. And if I go, so if I go, am I doing that wrong? I'm doing that wrong. So, so that would be two plus three. How did it work? Well, I played a one and a five chord, right? So if I'm going one, five, so you're going to hear the one as, as like beat one because of that harmonic aspect. And so whenever you're getting involved with that, um, those types of meters, you look to divide them into some combination of three, two. So another common one that we have is seven, eight. So three plus two plus two is the most common. One two three one two one two one two three one two one two one two three one two one two or one two three four five six seven one two three four five six seven one two three four five six seven right you could count it all the way to seven but the subdivision the one two three one two one two is the more fundamental aspect and if you focus on that that might help you keep track of where you are so you don't get lost in five four or seven eight or anything like that and I think one of the ways to do that would be to like I said, Google um, what's out there and then listen to them and see if you can count along, like tap along, count along. Um, there's a great Blue Rondo a la Turk. So Dave Brubeck, he's the one that did Time Out, which is this, uh, oh no, Take Five, I'm sorry, from the album Time Out. So take five is this five four. So this is Dave Brubeck uh, is a jazz pianist composer, and he's he would be great to listen to, right? Listen to his album. Uh, the album's called Time Out. He got songs like Take Five, which is in five four. There's Blue Rondo a la Turk, which is kind of uh, not an asymmetrical meter, but with asymmetrical accents. So it's like so it's like one two one two one two one two three one two one two one two one two one two three so it's like two plus two plus two uh sorry two plus two plus two plus three which is essentially like nine eight but it's not nine eight like you normally see it which would be a compound triple meter of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's not like that. It's one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two. But then he shifts it into three plus three plus three. And it keeps going back between this accent of two, two plus two plus two plus three to three plus three plus three. Both of them equal nine. So the, the downbeats stay the same but the accent shifts within that. So that would be a great album for you to listen to, to kind of tap along with it, do a Google search, find some other songs that are like that. And just kind of remember that this, it's all this stuff is just combinations of two, or th two and three. And if you simplify it like that, and don't worry about necessarily counting all the way up to seven or 11 or even five, just, just be like, I'm going to keep my eye on the bar line. I'm just going to be going one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. And just keep your eye moving uh, at the right place in the piece. I think you'll probably be, you'd probably be in pretty good shape. So I hope that helps. Underground D, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. Dr. B, great fan of your lessons. About lesson 22 now. All right, excellent. You get, you're coming along. Man. Uh, I keep making videos. I don't want you to run out. And I know some of you have watched all of them. Uh, so I hope that you have, you have a lot of great stuff to keep going. If you're only at Lesson 22, there's some more good stuff. What is 
minor five, sir. I can't understand. Okay, minor five. Uh, so this is going back again. This is why uh, when I'm doing these Q and A's, we get we get into all sorts of things complexity wise that you might not have gotten up to yet. So the idea of minor five is it's a minor triad. So it's a Roman numeral five. So we don't write it as a five. We don't write the Arabic numeral five. We write a Roman numeral five and we write it lowercase. So it's a Roman numeral. And there's, so this is what I'm talking about, Roman numeral five. It's a minor triad because it's written lowercase. And if your key is, let's say, C minor, when I say Roman numeral 5, minor 5, it means based on the fifth scale degree. So that would be C, D, E flat, F, G. So the chord based on scale degree 5 is called the 5 chord. And the reason I say minor 5 is because normally we raise the leading tone and we make it a major 5 chord. And by five, we're talking about the Roman numeral where it occurs within a key. So uh, that five again, let me say that again. The, the minor is referring to sonority because there's major, minor, augmented, diminished for triads. And then the five is referring to where it occurs within a key. It's that the chord built upon the fifth note of the key. So if you're in F, the fifth note is a C, F, G, A, B, B flat C or F G A flat B flat C, the triad you built upon that five that fifth note is called a five chord. And then in a minor key, they tend to be. If you just look at the natural form, it's a minor triad, so we say a minor five. But often it's raised. You raise what's called the leading tone, which is scale degree seven, and you make it a major five chord. So one of the challenges is very often I'm talking, admittedly, reasonably quickly. I'm saying minor five, it's a leading tone, scale degree seven. And part of what you want to be able to do as a music theory student or person who's getting better at writing and composing music is start getting the terminology and understanding it quickly. Uh, I do tell my students that speed counts. In part, not just because you know, there's a time limit on the test, but if you're trying to figure out something really complicated and you got to go all the way back to be like, what's the notes in that scale? What's that interval? By the time you figure all that stuff, you might have forgotten what the original question was. So that's why I say speed counts. So that's what I'm talking about when I say a minor five chord. Uh, all right. All right, we've got some of you helping each other out. That's great. All right, all good, learning a lot, I love it. So this is from, that was tricky. Can I use the notions that you gave us to analyze modern soundtracks of, of Japanese composers? Music composed by people of a different culture with a different ear who follow different rules. That's an excellent question. So in general, the answer will be yes, you can. So yes, you can. And let me, let me clarify, so So, so there's a composer named Tan Dunn. I'm not, I'm not sure of nationality, uh, but uh, writes film, film scores. And very often when we talk about kind of Asian culture, whether that's Chinese, Japanese, and I'm not saying they're the same, Korean, Malaysian, all the different... There, there, there's, there's a lot of differences, so I'm not putting them all into one category. I'm not, even, I'm not doing that. Uh, what I am saying, though, is that uh, there, there's definitely a different ear, and it's, coming, it's not coming out of necessarily the ancient Greek Pythagorean tuning systems and then how it evolved in the Middle Ages to equal temperament tuning. So, yeah, there's a different ear, and there's a different... different, there's a different different style to some of that music. That said, there's a lot in common because a lot of what we're talking about, and you've heard me say it more than once, acoustics, 
human nature, science, right? Doesn't matter where, what culture you come from. We all are human. We all have essentially the same biology in terms of the way we hear things, the way our brains process things, the way our emotions work. Not necessarily what we feel, but the way they work, the mechanism, the hardware, the software, the wetware, whatever we want to call that. There's definitely a lot of similarities. And a lot of the reasons Western music evolved the way it did was a combination of these universals, science, acoustics, psychology, that applies to everyone. And then some of it is cultural. So there's two, two sides of it, right? There's the cultural side, which changes, and then there's the universal. And when we are studying music theory, we're studying both, right? We're talking about both. And I sometimes I try to point out when, when something is definitely in the universal side, I'll sometimes say, this is the way human beings hear things. I'm not just saying about Western European, I'm saying human beings hear it this way. The perfect fifth is the most constant interval, not just in the Western world, in every culture. That fifth is your like, that's your foundation. It's your perfect, it's the first interval it's, that's different, with different notes, it's got a thing, and you will, you'll hear things resolve and revolve around that. Um, you also have certain, that tension and relaxation. Now how that happens is sometimes very different from culture to culture. So, I would say that you're probably going to be able to use, you know, I would say maybe as 50% of what we're talking about, probably more, to be honest. Um, I would say, let me put it this way. You can use 50% of what we're talking about to analyze music from other cultures. That means you're only halfway there. There's a lot different. Um, and I remember I was at a, at a certain point, I was really, really into trying to figure out the difference between North Indian and South Indian music. I'm talking about the subcontinent of India and studying the difference between the kind of sitar, tabla style of North Indian music compared to South Indian music. And I was listening to different styles and recordings and I was going to concerts. And I definitely got to a point where I was like, I, I understood, a, you know, I understood a good amount. But I remember going to a concert and being like, you know, I don't think I can figure out any more without really having someone from the culture explain it to me, like there was a limit on how much I could understand without the cultural references. Like I could only go so far to understand it from, from the universal side of perspective of music, of rhythm, of melody, of tonal center, of modal centers. Um, and then at a certain point I was like, yeah, I, I definitely don't, I definitely feel like I'm missing stuff that I just don't get. And the same would be true if someone who went, came and looked at let's say, who'd never ever heard of Christianity, did not know anything about it, and then saw some of the religious paintings. And you might be able to say, oh, I, I can understand the use of color, of perspective, but this whole guy on a cross thing, I don't know what you guys are, what, what, what's your point with this? There just would be some cultural things that would not be understood without understanding the culture. So in the case that you're talking about, um, composers, soundtracks by Japanese composers, Western culture has been so influential that a lot of the Japanese composers writing soundtracks to movies are blending their culture with Western. So this is being blended. Um, and so what they're using is they're using some, let's say, Japanese cultural elements and some Western cultural elements and there's this universal aspect of music. So you're going to be able to get more than 50% when you analyze most soundtracks by a Japanese composer because there's some Western cultural musical elements that are involved in it as well. The aspects that are usually non-Western tend to be instrumentation. You'll find instruments that are non-Western instruments, which means different timbres. You will have more exploration of modality than you might expect, but at this point, Western music has so much modality in it as well that that's not as unique as it used to be because that's kind of been reabsorbed into the musical language. And there will be certain melodic 
very much melodic um, inflections, stylistic things. So like the way in which you use trills or grace notes, that type of ornamentation is going to be uniquely from, a, from, a, from the non-Western culture. That's where you'll find a lot of the, the biggest differences. Melodic inflections, instruments, maybe more modal, so the harmonies won't change in the same way. That said, there's a lot of stuff under that that's going to be very common. Uh, and you're going to find that there's a lot that's shared within that. So, yeah, you, you're going to be able to get a lot. But, you know, that's why it's, there's going to be something you don't get unless you absorb that culture. And this is true within Western cultures. You know, just because we say Western culture doesn't mean they're all the same. Goodness gracious, Italian music versus German music versus French versus English, they're very different. Um, and and I, I've mentioned on this, on these, you, my, my series here more than once that I lived in Germany for a year. And I actually had the goal while I was living there to try to understand why German music sounds like German music. I wanted to know why the German music kind of tended to be more on a bigger scale than French music often, more kind of like tense and gritty and muscular. And my father was born in Germany, so I got a little bit of that idea growing up being raised, you know, so for anyone who grew up with German parents, um, you know, there's a, a toughness, there's a, a muscular quality, there's a, uh, you know, like, how to describe... Uh, when, you, when I went to Germany, it was Christmas time, there was a parade, and I'm, I see what looks like Santa Claus coming down. But it's not Santa Claus. It's like similar, like it's similar to Santa Claus, like a red outfit and stuff. But Santa Claus has like this big whip, and there's this other person dressed up like, like, some, like a cross between a dog and a devil. And Santa's whipping the dog devil. And it's, it's St. Nicholas. And this is like, St. Nicholas is not like fluffy, ha, a Hallmark American Santa, ho, 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 jolly, let's drink a Pepsi or Coca-Cola. I forget who endorsed him, uh, who did it, right? But it's like, this is Santa Claus is like, you know, down with the sinning devil. You know, it's like, and I'm like, whoa, that's different than American. And so things like that. So what makes French music French? So when I was in France, I was trying to, I was asking all my French composer and musician friends, what do you think it is? What is it? And they were like, well, everything's so close together in France. So we have all, we like miniatures, and we, but we like really contrast, but we like things really condensed. It's why, why we like to have like um, a mousse-bouche, a little, little piece of cuisine that's really small, but super, super tasty. So they thought about that, the geography of France and how close things were affected both the cuisine and the music. So keep all those things in mind and this is why it's, I think it's a beautiful thing to travel. It's a wonderful thing to, to experience other cultures and learn, like, what makes that culture different? What's the, you know, and that, if you ever get into composing or analyzing or just appreciating other music, that's going to help you. We got another from uh, Tomas. Why are you focusing so much on harmony instead of a more important concept like motivic development? Excellent question. Um, one is that in the United States, in terms of what my students need to get accepted into colleges and get scholarships and graduate, that's what we focus on. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's the way it is right now, that the focus is so much more on harmony than on motivic development. And certainly motivic development is important. And, and we do talk about it some in, in the United States, and I talk about it some. You can go to some of my lessons and videos online and you'll see where we do some analysis of melodies. We talk about a period versus a sentence, a consequent phrases, antecedent phrases, and we look at, at some of those things, but we're not going as deep into it. The other reason why I, I don't talk about as, as much as maybe some would is because I'm teaching primarily Music Theory 1 and Music Theory 2, the first two semesters of college music theory. And Motivic development is usually something that's covered in like a music theory three or a music theory four. I've studied that. I, I can, you know, I've definitely have, have some knowledge about that, but that's not my primary day-to-day go-to thing that I'm talking about. And it's usually not what people start off with.
they usually start off with learning about the harmonies. And here's how you spell the chord. Here's how the chords relate to each other. Um, and then they come to motivic development later on. But, you know, you're, you're certainly not wrong in saying there should be more motivic development discussion. And so uh, one of the other requests that I've gotten has been to analyze pieces. And if you do find some of those videos that I've done in the past, I will talk to a certain extent about how the melody and how the motive is developed and how it's varied. Just the ABBA song I was mentioning, Winner Takes It All, is a great example of motivic development of this ascending minor seventh leap. And so as I start looking and doing more, I'm, I'll add that to my list to really make sure that when I analyze a song that I'm looking at the motivic development and sharing the principles and the ideas behind that. I'm not going to get into it right now because I want to make sure I have a, an actual example to show you and work through. I mean, I could play you the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And talk about the four note, four note motif, if you want, for my European friends. And how it gets, it gets, it gets sped up, it's moved to different levels, and how that then turns into other melodic, kind of free melodic uh, writing after that as that theme un develops itself. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on getting further deep into motivic development until I have a real good example to kind of walk, walk, walk you through step by step. But it's a good point. It's a good point. Why talk so much about, motivic, about harmony and not give motivic development its due? Why not give melody its due? It's part of that melody thing. And you're not wrong. And, 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 and it's, it is something that's very important. Okay. Uh, moving forward here. Let's see what we have next. Uh, let's see. Uh, I scrolled down. Oh, we've got lots of questions. Woo. I, might, I might run out of time. We're getting close to two hours. And it's usually when I... That's usually when the, uh, the battery pack on my lav mic starts running out. I've, you started, I've slowly tried to up the production values of these because sometimes the, the audio wouldn't be good or the video wouldn't be good. So that's why I have a, like a light here in my, my, my studio so that I can get it. So I'm, if the cl cloud goes over the sun, it, the, the autofocus doesn't go all wacky on me. Uh, so we're getting there. We're getting there in terms of production value. But again, I'm doing, the, I'm doing this, I'm a one-man production team. All right. Uh, Anton, Dr. B, what makes a good harmonic progression to write a melody or solo over? Is there anything about the number of measures we use? Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you very much for sharing. So, Anton, uh, yeah, good harmonic progression. I'm going to direct you to my, my lesson videos, uh, and I have them labeled, and I, you know, and, I, and I try to label everything. Now, I haven't... I haven't labeled the last couple YouTube live videos. I've just been, it's been the beginning of the semester and with the whole COVID thing, I'm doing things in a way that I've never done before. So uh, unfortunately I haven't been able to keep up with updating that, but all my lesson videos have timings on what I cover and, and what's in it. So I would look at uh, my harmonic progression, chart of good harmonic progression. So there's definitely rules and some progressions that are gonna work. Uh, I'll say to you quickly, circle of fifths. This is your friend. So, you know, one. And then if you jump on the train and go, let's say, three, six, uh, two, five, one. So this is not circle of fifths, but the rest of them are. Anything that's circle of fifths related is going to work out real well for you. Um, and there's some variations of that, and uh, we can get a lot more complex, but I'm going to direct you to that. And then, in terms of the number of measures, four measure phrases. This is it. It's the symmetry. It's just how, like harmonic progression often works. So, so if we think about... Uh, Let's see how I would would put this. Um, let me let me do this part. 
let me just take out the three and just go one, six, two, five. If we're doing this, one chord, three, four, six chord, two chord, five. If you do four beats per chord, that's four measures. It's, it's a cycle that just, you can just keep repeating it over and over. It just feels right. The symmetry, four measure phrases are your friends. And you can do variations, right? You can say, okay, I'm going to go one, four, two, five, one, right? So you go one down to four, and then switch over to two. That's not circle fist. So there's, you use some level of circle of fist, and you use some jumps by a third, you can look at my, my chart and that should help you, but stick with four measure phrases, stick with, stick with that chart, great place to start, and then you can start getting more complex and putting in substitutions and things like that. All right. Uh, thank you, Wasco, thank you for the, uh, for the shout out, I appreciate, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, we got some people making a Facebook account just for this. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Danny Pippen. So talk, Anton, talk to Danny Pippen. Danny's your guy for the Facebook. Uh, Lydian Chromatic Concept. So I have this book somewhere. This is George Russell. Uh, and I remember when I was, this was something that a lot of jazz musicians were into. I'm going to just try to write this down for those of you who are interested. I, I do not remember enough of this to talk about it intelligently right now. Lydian chromatic uh, Lydian chromatic method, is that what they call it all the time? I think so. Or concept, yeah, concept I think. I don't remember enough. I don't. Uh, I can tell you that I read it. I I generally felt I understood it, and I don't remember really it really changing what I was doing as a as a jazz improviser at the time. So maybe I didn't understand it thoroughly. Uh, and if I were to go back to it now, I, I I might have a different look. So that's something I can add to my 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 to do list along with negative harmony. So sorry there. Danny, you're, 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 in, you're in all this stuff. One more, Barry Harris's six diminished scale. Uh, I gotta ask my friend about this and I gotta, I'm gonna make a note. So I, I have a, a jazz pianist friend named Larry Ham. And if you guys ever wanna look up his website, Larry Ham, this guy's a really good jazz pianist. Uh, and he lives, lives, used to live in Manhattan but moved back to where he grew up, which is where I live close by. So we've played a number of gigs together. He studied with Barry Harris, and so uh, I, I'm, I can ask him about this uh, because he'll be able to explain it to me a lot better than I can, you know, kind of talk about it. It has a, has a lot to do with, you know, making sure chord tones fall on downbeats, passing tones go on upbeats, where the chromatic, where the passing tones go, it has a lot to do with that. But I can ask my friend Larry, and you know, if you're interested, look up his website. He's I got some great tunes up there. So I'm going to put that one on hold as well as a to do. Greetings from Mexico. Hey, thanks Mexico. Uh, Yana Matia. Oh, love learning. Uh, I don't know if it's so. Uh, you guys, I'm going to give a shout out to. I don't know, and again, I don't know if it's Yana or Gianna. I. You could, it's, I'm going to write her name here. Look up, look up, look up her, her website. She, she's an artist and an illustrator. And every time I see her drawings, it makes me smile. She, and she does lots of like, you know, like an, nice furry, cuddly animals and, and some not so cuddly ones. And they're, and sometimes they're playing a musical instrument. So you got like a, you know, a bear playing guitar or a cat playing the lute. Uh, and it's just, it's just every time I see her artwork, it makes me smile. So go, go look her up. But she, she, this is again, she, she's a, a, an artist, but she plays guitar and she loves learning about other art forms. And this is, this is kind of like a great lesson for us all that, that there's a certain level of curious, not curiosity and love of learning that is really makes your life wonderful. 
And, uh, you know, I, I love the visual arts. I love learning about dancing. I love, obviously, I love music. Uh, architecture has been, like, my latest, one of my latest things that I'm really getting into. Like, you know, I'm, like, starting to word, learn words like dormer and uh, all sorts of architectural terms that I, I, I'm starting to... I'm starting to really appreciate what architecture means and what it can do. And so it's, it's a good lesson for us all to learn, keep learning everything. Alan, thank you. Thanks for the birds and bees analogy you nailed. <laughs> I try to, I want to make sure, you know, because YouTube makes you say, is this, is this for kids? You know, do you use lots of profanity? I want to have as wide an audience as possible. So I'm trying to keep the birds and the bees analogy as uh, friendly as possible. All right. Uh, can you show the music theory books again? Uh, yeah, sure. Let me show up. So those music theory books. So I'll, I'll give you give you um, all. So there's uh, where did I put it? Ah, there it is. So Harper Collins College Outline, music theory. Harper Collins is the publisher. You got that one. Then you got, and it's gonna look different because this is an old edition. This is what my high school choir teacher gave me to borrow. He hasn't gotten it back yet. Harmonic Materials and Tonal Music, a program course. Paul O'Harder, it's been taken over by another author for updating, but you can find that out. Uh, my college classes use this book. It's a, I don't know, it's probably a newer edition now, but Tonal Harmony, Cosca and Payne. What's nice about getting an older edition is they have self-tests, and then in the back they have all the answers. So I think that's a really good way to go. But there's so many good books out there. And I, I don't want to, like, if there's a music theory author out there whose book I'm not holding up, you know, I, I apologize. There's a lot of good books. I'm not saying that these are the best books or the only books. These are the books that I've used that I've thought were helpful. And they're not perfect, right? That even in, you know, the textbook I use for my college class, every now and then they introduce a concept that, hasn't been presented yet. And I'm like, guys, you can't present this yet. It's confusing my students. Uh, but, but you gather these different sources and they all will help you to, to, a, to a big degree. All right, uh, so let me see. I'm gonna try to wind this up fairly soon so I don't run out of, of battery and have things die. And I apologize, last time that's what happened. Battery, uh, battery died and we were cut short. So, YouTuber, uh, I love music theory. My goals are to write like romantic period music. What is the key of, of this music? Well, uh, we talked a little bit about using wide leaps. The other is to use a lot of mode mixture and some of those chromatic harmonies. So mode mixture is another big one uh, that will kind of like, if you're looking for like the quick way, right? Use some mode mixture, write melodies with wide leaps. That's gonna get you a pretty good amount of the way right there. So kind of like the end of my lesson videos really gets into like augmented six chords and the other one is modulation. You gotta, you gotta modulate to some distant keys. Don't modulate to the closely related keys. Modulate to the distant keys. Uh, and then do some score analysis. Find one of these romantic pieces that you really like. Get the score. I am SLP is like a great, again, you live in a great age where there's so much information available for, it's like so much, there's so much information. The hard part now is knowing what's the quality info. So I am SLP is like public domain music scores. So if you want to learn to write like someone, pick one of those pieces, go in here, see if you can find it. Like the, like Ravel, let's, you know, someone mentioned Pavon for a dead princess, which I, I I'm not going to, uh, you know, there's the French title, which you might have to search up. Uh, but you can look that up. And so you study scores. So, and then use them as a model, right? So you can say, one of the best things to do if you want to learn how to compose like someone or in a style is take a score and just take, let's say, let's take 16 measures, right? So you take 16 measures. You analyze it. You analyze it in terms of its melody its motivic development, and its harmony. And then you basically give yourself the task of taking away 
one of those things and you writing your own thing but keeping the other. So let's say you say, I'm going to keep the melody. I'm going to steal Ravel's melody, but I'm going to put my own new harmonies to it. I'm going to reharmonize it. And I'm going to try to use harmonies that give it a slightly different feeling, but, but still sound awesome with this melody. Think about how much you're going to learn doing that, right? Because you have to really understand Ravel's melody, and then you have to come up with something different. Or do the opposite, right? So either you keep the melody and put in new harmonies, or keep the harmony and write a new melody. But keep the same 16 measures and the same structure. This is the trick, and I, I, when, I, when I teach composition lessons, I'll have students analyze like a Beethoven piano piece, and I'll say, it's got to be, it's, you know, keep the form, you know, like you have melody A, B, A prime, C. Let's say that's like four measures of each, right? So four measures, four measures, four measures, four measures. You keep the same structure. You're going to use the harmony, but your melody has to follow the same form. That's what structure is talking about. So you want to keep it. And then you could say, okay, maybe I'm going to, you know. So I would say the things most valuable to keep is structure and form. Try not to change those when you're, when you're doing this. But go ahead and try to write your own melody to their harmonies and try to write your own harmonies to their melody. And that kind of score analysis combined with compositional exercise, you do that on a couple pieces that you're like, I like this style. I want to write in this style. You'll learn so much, and then you're gonna by by doing your own version, you're naturally gonna come up, start to develop your own style within that style. Because when we talk about a romantic style, there's many different romantic composers, and each of their style is is different, but it's all romantic. So that would be how I recommend you start with with uh, learning how to write romantic period music. Okay, so let me just put up the other ones. Uh, so study scores. Do this, these compositional exercises. Mode mixture. Um, so if you're using your own harmonies, mode mixture. Distant modulations. And by that I mean modulate from C to E flat. E flat would be a distant key because it's because it's it's many accidentals different in the key signature that's what a distant modulation means so there's not as many notes in common c to g is a close modulation because there's only one note different f becomes f sharp c to e flat is very different because e becomes e flat a becomes a flat b becomes b flat so there's three notes different versus one note different so distant modulations uh, and then wide leaps in your melody Start with that, and that'll get you a, a good, good bit of the way. All right, uh, one more thing from YouTuber. Uh, I've seen your chord progression map. Please, can you just explain it one more time? For you, yes. Let me explain that chord. And this is someone else. I referred them to this, but I will go ahead and I'll explain it again. Because sometimes you need to hear it more than once, and sometimes... You just need to hear it explained slightly differently. So you always start with at home base, which is your one chord. One can go anywhere because your home you can go to any one of the chords. Uh, let me let me see if I'm gonna I'm gonna to keep it interesting for me. I'm gonna see if I can make my chart a different way. You can go anywhere. You can go to two. You can go to three, you can go to four, you can go to five, you can go to six, you can go to seven. So one you can go anywhere, right? This is home base. Now, once you go somewhere, there's paths. You can't go straight back, right? This is, this is, a, this is these from one. These are like one-way tickets in, in most in most. Not all, but in some, right? Now let's take a look at which ways are which ones are two-way. So going to a two chord is a one-way ticket. Three is really a one-way ticket unless you're really just expanding the one. So if you go one, three, one, three, one, which happens in a lot of popular music.
right? Really what that is, is it just all like, just a, a little variation, all it, it's called an expansion of tonic. There's two notes in common between one and three. There's just a little bit of variation. It's an expansion. So it's really sitting in one place. It's not really technically a progression. So if you're talking about a progression, and that doesn't mean like this is bad, right? Progression is good. So is sitting in a place and having what's called an expansion. Expansion of one. So you can do that. But in terms of chord progressions, three is a one-way ticket. Four is not. You can go to four and come straight back to one. You can go to five and come straight back to one. You can't do that with six. Um, you can do that with seven. So it's really two, three, and six, where once you go there, you can't go directly back to one. Um, seven is so related to five, these are almost kind of the same, but major, you know, like it's like one, four, five, these are your, like, uh, let me see, this is your like power wedge. This is the power wedge, you know, this is where you can make all the songs in the world with one, four, five, one. You know, you can harmonize every, any note in the scale with one, four, five, one. This is like when people say, oh, he's just one, four, five, one. There's a reason, like, that's all you need to make music. Like, chord music and some great songs are just one, four, five, one. And they just, because they're all major and because they're all so related, you can just go back and forth. It's the two, three, and six. When you start getting to those minor sonorities in particular, where then, then they have certain rules on where they want to go. Okay, and where they want to go is often related to the circle of fifths. So if we say, okay, circle of fifths, it's basically going one, two, jumping forward, like that. So two loves to go to five, circle of fifths. Three loves to jump over and go to six, circle of fifths. So that's, 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 circle of fifths option is so good. Um, so what else is possible? Because that's not the only one, right? So three can just move up by step to four. And four can move up step by step to five. And five can move up by step to six. Two does not go to three. Six does not go to seven. So you got this other area here where things just can move up by step. So we got the wedge, we've got circle of fifths, which is basically means down a fifth. So down a perfect fifth or up a fourth means the same thing, right? It's all, all circle of fifths means. So there's this, this is what the, the green arrows are showing. The, the red arrow is up by step. And that, that gets you most of the way there, but not all the way. So, so what else is possible? So six can go to, uh, can go to four. I will indicate that. So six can go to four. And this is going to be super complicated looking. But again, you, you, you've heard me do it the other way. So I'm, let me just give you another way and just... Let's just see if it works, Let's see if it makes sense. Um, five and seven are so kind of like, sub, seven is often a substitution for five, so you can kind of like pretend where, whatever where five is, you could just put seven, and it would be seven diminished six because you won't find it in root position. Um, four will go, so, so two will all go, often go to five or seven diminished because, again, keep in mind we have what, what I'm calling the, the substitution, that's the squiggle line. Um, three will go to four or six, which we've got. Four will go, go to five. Four can also go to two. So just like, so it's interesting. I'm wondering if, I'm trying to see if there's patterns. So you see how six will skip one and go to four and four can skip one and go to two. And these will skip two. The green line skips two forward Green line skips two forward. The red line goes one, 
and then this blue arrow will just skip one instead of skipping two. So I, I am getting like, and I would, I would, you know, I'm kind of tempted just to take seven out of the mix for right now because it complicates the matter. And it's the only one that's a diminished triad. And if I were just dealing with major and minor triads, I kind of get a little bit of a pattern here, right? I kind of get a little bit of a pattern of how these chords relate to each other. And I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to wrap things up here because I want to take a picture of that because I think there's something to having this kind of visual representation. One, four, five is your core of three major triads. Because they're the core, they can go, you can go to them and back. There's no, nothing you have to do afterwards. But once you get to some of the minor, if you go into the minor triads, then there's certain rules. Like six, you got to go, you got to go back. Um, you you got to go like to jump to four, right? Or if you're at four, you can jump to two. And if you're at three, you can jump one forward, or forward, one forward, one forward. So I hope that helps a little bit. I, I don't know if I made things more confusing or less with that. I think there's something there. Uh, again, I'm, I'm putting myself out on the spot here and coming up with stuff on the fly. There's something there to these patterns with the arrows um, where, where you can kind of visualize what chords want to pull themselves to what chords, what chords tend to go in different directions. So uh, everyone, I, I really appreciate you being here with me today. Um, I, I, I apologize for those of you who, who I was not able to get to, uh, but we're, we're over two hours in and eventually the batteries on everything here is going to start dying. So before that happens, I want to thank you all for joining me. Hope you have a good time working with all these music theory things, composing, passing exams, whatever it is you're doing. And I plan to be back two weeks from today. I'm going to be always trying to do Saturdays uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern time. I try to do around two hours or so and uh, see, what we can, we, see what kind of music stuff we can discuss. And I appreciate all the challenging questions, negative harmony, motivic development, Lydian chromatic concept, there's so much things for me to also be working and keep on growing. So you keep learning, I'll keep learning, and I hope to see you two weeks from now. Thanks, everybody. Take care.